Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Lucia Noel. I'll be moderating today. I am a coastal resilience thematic expert with Earth Journalism Network and an international disaster and urban resilience consultant with a firm called Miyamoto International. Today's webinar has been organized by Earth Journalism Network, which is a program of the global media development organization, Internews. To provide uh, just a quick background on EJN, the Earth Journalism Network has a mission to improve the quality and quantity of journalism around the world um, in environment by helping journalists report on climate change, biodiversity and conservation, pollution and other issues by providing story grants, training fellowships and other kinds of supports. EJN is also a community of 14,000 journalists in about 180 countries. If you're not a member, please visit earthjournalism.net to register and you will be the first to hear about future grants and upcoming events. Today's webinar is all about urban resilience. Um, in this webinar directed towards journalists, we are joined by two experts uh, who will present on the challenges and opportunities to build safe, sustainable, and livable cities as um, climate change effects become more and more pronounced around the world. We will also discuss how journalists can cover this subject, misconceptions to avoid, new angles to explore, and tips for finding data and sources. Joining us today on the panel, we have Dr. Christina Hill and Dr. Furkan Asif. Uh, Dr. Hill is the director of the Institute of Urban and Regional Development at UC Berkeley. She studies adaptation and coastal flooding and climate change. Uh, she uses a unique approach that includes groundwater mapping and adaptation pathways to come up with urban design alternatives. Dr. Hill has contributed to adaptation plans for US cities, federal agencies, and the Rockefeller Foundation. She edited the book Ecology and Design in 2002, has published a wide range of journals and was featured in a documentary about urban flooding called Sinking Cities on PBS and a national podcast called Hidden Brain. Her PhD is from Harvard University and her current project is a book about adapting to cities, adapting cities to rising. Welcome and thank you for being here, Dr. Hill. Uh, we are also joined by Dr. Asif um, a, as a self-proclaimed accidental academic Dr. Asif started his career in policy-oriented work and has, over the past decade, worked at the intersection of environment, policy, and international development. Dr. Asif has held positions at the Canadian federal government, non-governmental, and intergovernmental levels. His research has focused on marine conservation, coastal fisheries and livelihoods, migration, climate resilience. Dr. Asif is currently a postdoctoral researcher focusing on aquaculture governance. He has a PhD in international development, a master of science, a master of environmental science, excuse me, and an honors bachelor of science in biology and environmental science. Following both speakers' presentations, we will open it up to about 30 minutes of audience questions. Um, just a note that we will be monitoring the Q&A feature throughout, but we will not be monitoring the chat. So please make sure you put your questions into the uh, Q&A feature and not into the chat. Thank you very much. Um, and lastly, this webinar is being recorded. Attendees will receive an email with a link uh, to the recording once it's finished. Mm -hmm. um, my final announcement before we turn it over to uh, both of the speakers is uh, a reminder of EJN's current grant opportunity, the Coastal Resilience Media Grant. This is a unique opportunity for projects focused on professional development for journalists, specifically on increasing their capacity to explore and report on coastal resilience solutions. Um, Hannah will place the link in the chat and a reminder that applications are due May 2nd. So thank you for that. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, which is um, Dr. Hill. Great, <clears throat> thank you. And uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be here with you all and with my uh, co-panelists and hosts, thank you. Just opening my slide. So uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what's going on with sea level rise that might be um, beyond the stories that you've heard so far. And I'm gonna do that pretty quickly in 15 minutes. And I apologize in advance, I tend to use slides as punctuation. So it's gonna go quickly. <laughs> uh, one of the things I like to remind people is that cities have really only been around for the last five to 8,000 years. And that is the exact same time during which sea level rise slowed down. In the past, and this graph goes back to 24,000 years ago, 
in the past, sea level rise has been really fast. And cities were developed during a time when it was slow. And now we have to figure out how to have cities com be compatible with a period when it's going to be rapid again. In the state of California, the state is giving guidance to public agencies that they have to anticipate sea level rise of between one meter and three meters by 2100. And of course, it'll continue after 2100. Uh, that's just a magical year people refer to, but it's of course gonna continue and become more rapid each year. Um, what the state is telling us is that we need to be ready for three meters if we're building something very expensive that's intended to be permanent. And we can use an assumption of one meter if we're building something that's inexpensive and intended to be temporary. So that's an interesting combination of magnitudes and timing. And it's almost a question we should all introduce ourselves with. What is the assumption about sea level rise in your region? And that's the assumption in mind between one and three meters. Sea level rise won't cause the um, flooding by itself. And that's really what I wanna talk about today is what else is going to cause that flooding. The Dutch have been thinking about compound flooding or multiple directions of flooding since before 2009, but this particular graphic is from Rotterdam's water plan in 2009. And the key piece of it is this arrow, which shows that as sea level rises, groundwater will also rise. At the same time, river flooding increases and extreme rainfall events become more common. The Dutch have known this for a long time. That's why they originally developed windmills was to pump groundwater up out of canals and over their uh, dikes. So one of the oldest adaptation strategies in the world has to do with groundwater. Unfortunately, they also learned over the last 800 years or more that um, when you pump, the land can sink. So that's a very important component of what we have to think about in all cities now. How can cities deal with rising groundwater without causing the land to sink, which makes their flooding problem worse? So the question is, what is groundwater? And it is that water that you find when you dig down in the sand at the beach with your children. <laughs> that's groundwater, and it's making its way to the ocean, which is what groundwater does. It flows towards the ocean it fills the pore spaces in sand below ground. It comes from rain and it's just the rain is stored in the soil and it's above the sea level because it's flowing towards the sea. So as the sea rises, this unconfined layer of water in the soil comes up. It's like a lighter water on top of a heavier salt water. They don't mix very well. So the lighter water, the fresh water in the soil rises. This is what it looks like when it's happening. This is at a high tide in um, San Leandro, California. It's about uh, 100 meters from the ocean. And the groundwater is coming up through a maintenance hole in the street, uh, causing a little fountain to occur and flooding the street. This is a diagram I use to try to explain to public audiences what's going on. And it shows the ocean in dark blue it shows freshwater groundwater in light blue. There's a levee here in green, a dry creek bed because I'm in California and we have a Mediterranean climate where creeks are often dry in the winter, I mean, sorry, in the summer. And then it shows um, pollution underneath, soil pollution underneath the parking lot because that's also something we have a lot of. We have a lot of former industrial sites, former military sites where the soil is polluted. And what we've done since the 1980s is cap that pollution with concrete, which is not a great solution when the water is coming up from below. And then we have sewer pipes, of course, under the streets typically. As the sea level rises, it's like it's got its toe under the land and it causes the groundwater to rise. You start seeing more flooding in creeks and there's inundation of these uh, polluted sediments under parking lots and sewer pipes start to discharge more water, which means that they're filling with groundwater. If they have any cracks at all, and across the United States, our sewer pipes have many, many cracks, pretty much all of them are cracked. Um, it's going to let groundwater in 
and that's going to use all the capacity in the pipe and the pipe will no longer be available to convey stormwater away or to convey human waste away because it'll already be full. And then eventually that flooding shows up on the surface. And notice that all of this has happened even though there's a levee. So one important story here to cover is that even if you build a levee, if you don't pump, you're going to get flooding behind the levee anyway. So billions of dollars can be wasted if some strategy isn't developed for how to deal with rising groundwater behind the levee and all of its consequences. This is an example of a study done in 2012 that showed that this effect of rising groundwater could extend as far as uh, about six kilometers inland. So it extends pretty far in and it could cause up to a 50% rise in stream flow. So we could see a lot more flow in surface streams because that groundwater discharges or flows out sideways into those stream beds and causes the water to rise even without increased rain. I modified the Dutch diagram just to make this point, which is that rising sea level causes rising groundwater, which causes streams to rise, somewhat independent even of an increase in extreme rainfall events. This is an example from New Zealand. I'm gonna skip through the video, but it's the uh, ocean coming onto a street in Christchurch, New Zealand at high tide. So that's what you're seeing here, it's not a river. And if you look to the left, it's the ocean coming onto the street. And we happened to be there that day when the tide was especially high. Um, and we saw this woman trying to clear the drain in a storm drain. But earlier we had seen that same storm drain bubbling up. So the infrastructure we've built that's meant to carry flood water away is actually going to allow flood water to come up into the street and create spot flooding and then eventually permanent flooding. Because the pipes underground are filling with water that leaks in through cracks. And Christchurch had an earthquake, a lot of their pipes are cracked. Um, California has earthquakes, a lot of our pipes are cracked. The whole Pacific Rim and of course um, areas in the Middle East and Mediterranean also have earthquakes and that adds to the problem. So the first critical impacts will happen underground long before you see groundwater emerging as flooding at the surface. And then the Pacific Rim, of course, has this incre increased risk of um, earthquakes. And along with that, a phenomenon called liquefaction. This is Christchurch, New Zealand also. It was a hotel room I was staying in when I was visiting folks there. And you can see this is the foundation of an old hotel that fell apart during their, was damaged very seriously during their earthquake. Um, and you can see the foundation area is filled with groundwater. And in the background, there's a river. The Avon River is behind this here. And um, this groundwater is directly connected to the river water. It's all connected underground. Um, so this building was at greater risk because its foundations were inundated by groundwater. And that's going to be a common occurrence around the world that rising sea levels are going to expose foundations to water they weren't designed to sit in. And that's gonna cause new risks. In addition to the phenomenon of, li of liquefaction itself, which is basically that the soil turns to a kind of jelly, acts like a liquid as the earthquake energy passes through it and objects like a car or a house, a building, um, have to adjust to the fact that they have no support. And in this case, the car fell right into the sandy soil and had to be dug out afterwards. Luckily, there was no one in this car, but it actually had to be excavated once the energy wave had passed and the soil turns back to a solid. There are contaminants in all of coastal areas that have former industrial land uses or military land uses. And in this example, it's from California, Richmond, California. Uh, there's world-class contamination, everything from radioactivity to hexavalent chromium, um, PCBs, DDT, everything we've ever made comes back to haunt us as uh, coastal groundwater rises into those old contaminated soils. What happens is, if you look on the top of this slide, you have a groundwater layer that's flowing towards the ocean. You have hazardous chemicals 
right above that layer. They have a concrete cap to keep the rain from coming through and carrying those chemicals through the soil to the ocean. And as the ocean itself rises, that groundwater rises and it intersects with the contaminants and carries them in new directions. So we're really talking about the risk of a toxic soup occurring in coastal areas where there are old contaminated soils. So it's almost like a little counterclockwise sequence of events, lost pipe capacity in storm and sanitary sewers, pollution remobilized, um, risks of liquefaction increasing as soils get wetter, and eventually surface flooding. And all of that can happen even if you have a levee or a seawall. So what are some of the strategies for uh, dealing with this? And I'll go through this super fast. There are walls. I've written some articles about this that uh, I'm happy to share um, that can be fixed, static, or dynamic, me meaning moving walls. Um, and there are landforms like dikes and levees, canals that are fixed. And there are landforms that are dynamic and moving, like the Dutch Sand Engine Project um, or wetlands in San Francisco Bay. And the key thing to know is dynamic walls are very expensive, basically the most expensive option. Static walls are the next most expensive. Static landforms like a levee or um, a mound is the next cheapest, but dynamic landforms like beaches and sand dunes and marshes are the cheapest and they provide two huge advantages. One is that they support biodiversity and the other is that they can be transformed over time by future generations. There's a big environment, or I'm sorry, intergenerational equity issue here, where if you build a wall and the sea level rises beyond the height that that wall was designed for, you end up having to take that wall out because the foundations can't just be added to. You have to take it out and replace it, which is much more expensive than something like a levee or a sand dune system where you can just add material as time goes by without having to rip out the old one. So it's a much better deal for future generations if we use landforms. These kinds of infrastructure projects like the um, Rotterdam storm surge barrier were built as sort of trophy projects that can show the capacity of Dutch engineering, but they aren't really transferable to countries that don't have the kind of capital for flood control that the Dutch have. For example, it's too expensive to build these in the United States. We wouldn't do it. So it's unlikely to transfer to other countries in the Pacific or um, the Southern Hemisphere generally. Levees are a much more transferable idea. Um, they get very expensive. They have to be a lot bigger in order to respond to more sea level rise. We've estimated in San Francisco area that's gonna cost between about 40 and 80 billion US dollars to build a seawall for just one meter of sea level rise. And to double that would be almost twice as much money. So it's an expensive strategy. Um, an adaptive shore zone that uses marshes, in this case for San Francisco Bay, or uses sand dunes. This is the original version of the uh, Zand motor or sand engine built in the Netherlands um, that was cheaper than conventional beach nourishment. And this is what it looked like just six years later. Um, this is better because it reduces wave energy. Both marshes and beaches allow you to have lower levees that cost less money and possibly no levee at all. Adaptive urban districts are the key though, because if you want to use a cheaper shoreline strategy, you need a city that can flood. And I'll just show you quickly an example from Germany. The city of Hamburg has a district called the Hafen City where they've hardened the first floor and they, it prevents it from, from flooding looks a little strange. There's a second story walkway emergency system for people to get around when the district floods. But the key thing is that people can live with the flooding. They don't have to evacuate. They can go down to the edge of the water, play with their kids at the edge of the water, and all their cars are in a parking garage under the building that's waterproof, except this person over here who must have been in Malaga on vacation and didn't get the email. And then the future of this will be to build new buildings with their foundations in the water, foundations that are designed to be in the water. And then in Japan, there's the um, super dike, which is actually a wider dike, not a taller dike, but it's a landform. It's just a much wider kind of levee and taller buildings have been built on it 
but it allows you to build on the levee, which is different from a conventional levee where you can't put a building on it. Um, artificial ponds have been dug and buildings have been put in artificial ponds, like this example in Rotterdam. That's another way to deal with higher groundwater to actually just live in a pond. And what's great about this one is that it can actually receive stormwater from the surrounding districts and it functions as a piece of infrastructure. And in the Dutch case, they've actually put relatively wealthy people in this. So it's as if rich people are paying to protect everybody else because they're living in houses in the infrastructure. I think that's a good deal. And then this last one, uh, Steiger Island is a floating development in Amsterdam on the water. And it was actually built as an affordable development and has stayed that way uh, relatively and uh, allows different kinds of families to live on the water and enjoy the experience of that. It's all prefabricated and um, it's an interesting design. It gets to pretty high density. So the last thing I'll do and I'll stop is just say briefly, the next generation is adaptive urban districts with wetlands and beaches. And that might look something like this to see artificial ponds dug where the groundwater is rising and conventional buildings are gonna fail anyway. So you dig these artificial ponds, you float prefabricated buildings on shared decking, like on a snowshoe that gives you more buoyancy, and you build wetlands between those ponds and the ocean to reduce wave energy and allow levees to be smaller. And that's a, a perspective of what one of those ponds might look like in San Francisco, and another aerial perspective of what it might look like to have artificial ponds with housing floating in them uh, next to a large wetland. And over time, we'd be able to roll back the rug, uh, essentially move these developments back over time landwards um, and allow the old ponds to become wetlands again so that we can move that whole system inland as we go on a flat shoreline, which is where the problems will be on flat shorelines. So I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill. Um, just a reminder, if there are any questions for Dr. Hill, please put them in the Q&A now, and we will uh, have about 30 minutes for questions at the end. I will now pass the mic to Dr. Asif. Thank you, Lucien. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen real quick here. Um, uh, I also want to thank my um, co-presenter for sharing a really excellent overview of some of the uh, high level um, examples of what cities and urban places are uh, doing. Uh, it's interesting that a lot of the examples were from where I am currently living in the Netherlands, which is a his and historically has been a, a country that has had to deal with um, pushing back the water for uh, many decades now. So with that high level overview, I'm going to uh, discuss, discuss the um, very specific case of coastal Cambodia, which is where I did uh, my doctoral research uh, a few years ago. Um, just to give you some grounded uh, context and perhaps inspiration and ideas for uh, potential areas uh, of inquiry for your work um, with respect to your um, yeah, journalism. So uh, just to provide some context first, um, in the coastal areas, in many parts of the global south, especially in Southeast Asia, uh, the coastal areas are heavily tied to fisheries and livelihoods, which is uh, what my research focused on. Um, and so with countries like Cambodia, but also Thailand, Vietnam, um, in Myanmar, there has been decades of history and reliance on fishing in particular as a livelihood. And it's also an important facet within Cambodian culture, food culture and history. Uh, so if you've ever been to the Angkor Wat temple or if you've heard about these Angkor Wat temples, the motifs, uh, some of the motifs actually feature um, fish. Uh, so it's a very important um, um, commodity. And so the fish, coastal fisheries is important in two ways. One is that um, the national average per capita uh, of fish consumption is 65 kilograms. And in the coastal areas in particular, it's 90 kilograms per capita per year. So it's a very important aspect in food security. 
And the other aspect has to do with livelihoods. So uh, within the broader fisheries sector, and so beyond just coastal fisheries, but also inland fisheries, um, Cambodia has the largest, if not one of the largest, or if not the largest lake in Southeast Asia, freshwater lake, uh, the Tonle Sap. Uh, and uh, combined all over the country, there are 6 million people that are employed in fisheries, um, either full-time, part-time, or seasonal. So it's a substantial part of um, the coastal or the Cambodian um, livelihoods in some way, shape, or form. Um, so that's the coastal context with respect to the people and, and livelihoods. There's also another important Con um, context that's uh, emerging within the coastal space in Cambodia, but also in other Southeast Asian countries. So this is a photo of Sihanoukville, which is a coastal city uh, not too far from uh, Phnom Penh, the capital. Uh, this is a photo of it before, um, a few years ago. And here's another photo of it uh, as well before I actually visited Sihanoukville around this time. And it, it did pretty much look like this. It was a pretty nice, um, if not quaint, uh, coastal town or coastal city. Uh, and then um, in the last few years, it has uh, undergone massive and rapid urban development. So this is what it looks like now, more or less. Um, so there are a lot of casinos, apartment buildings, a uh, combination of those two things, basically, uh, that have emerged in this coastal space. And if this is a view from uh, one of the buildings, you can see a lot of um, scaffolding um, that is a sign of all of the construction that's happening. So all of this is also happening um, with, uh, some of you may know, uh, Chinese investment and uh, uh, capital coming into the country that is funding a lot of this and um, a lot of this is going towards the building of casinos and sort of mini resorts and things like that. One of the challenges with respect to urban um, planning and urban resilience is that a lot of this is being done with little or no zoning uh, that is that's in place with respect to the uh, jurisdiction in the provincial government in Sihanoukville. Uh, and just to give you an, an idea of the 1.3 billion that has been invested in Sihanoukville over the last couple of years, um, 1.1 billion has come from China. So it's a very massive influx of capital that has uh, literally transformed the city. And of course, what this means also is going off of what Dr. Hill was speaking about, all of these changes will have uh, implications for how uh, residents and the city responds to impacts uh, from climate change like sea level rise for such a, a coastal town. Um, and another concerning part is that because a lot of this development is being done in that la that lacks environmental um, planning and environmental assessment, there are lots of uh, unknowns in terms of what has been done or has not been done to mitigate for some of the impacts. Um, and of course, in the coastal context, climate change in Cambodia is a very important component, and specifically with the people that depend on the coast, uh, i.e. fishing communities, they are also facing um, impacts from climate change. And so here is a quote from a fisher in uh, Kampot province uh, who says, the weather has changed completely. In the past year, we had the same strong wind, but it occurs predictably but now it can happen at any time. If we lose places to fish, what can they hope for? Uh, and by they, he's referring uh, to his son and the future generation. Um, and so um, the vulnerability to climate change is particularly important for Cambodia because of the strong connection of Cambodian people's livelihoods. So not just in this case, uh, fishing, but also farming. So in inland, um, a lot of um, Cambodians rely on farming as the source of their livelihood. But broadly, what this uh, picture is saying is that Cambodians um, are really dependent on the natural system. Now, unlike, you know, uh, many of us who live in uh, Western Europe or North America, our connection to the environment and natural systems is less obvious. Of course, we still have the connection, but in terms of our livelihoods, it's definitely not as uh, immediate. 
Um, and so the country's coastline is particularly vulnerable uh, to sea level rise, which will also cause other issues related to farming, which is the other important livelihood for Cambodians, um, where you have saltwater intrusion that um, will affect um, farming and yields for rice, for example. Um, and one of the other quotes from this uh, Fisher here, he said that I, um, regarding his son, he said, I want him to study and become a teacher or do other work because I think fishing at sea could be really risky in the future. I do not want him to be like me. And so that also um, brings into uh, the picture the idea that um, a lot of these challenges that um, Cambodians face with respect to their livelihood that is impacted by environmental and climate change uh, is resulting in um, people moving. And so this is a quote from one of my um, research participants, um, a commune chief who said, in the rainy season, when where there are storms, there will be storms, but the storms now, they don't stay in the same season, always have irregular storms. And so when you think about uh, fishers and farmers in many parts of the world, they depend on cues from the weather so which season it is, what the weather is doing to be able to time the planting of their crops or in my research context, when whether to go fishing or not. So this lack of predicting will directly impact their ability to, um, uh, to have livelihoods or at least um, livelihoods that are actually tenable in some way. And so um, one of the consequences of this that I discovered in my research was that migration was becoming more and more common for um, coastal Cambodians in the villages that I worked in. And so migration itself within Cambodia, of course, there is a history of it. Uh, and this is a photo from uh, a journalist uh, photographer who uh, took this photo after the ousting of the Khmer Rouge of Cambodians migrating on a train. So there is, uh, of course, historical context, but in the more contemporary context, migration is becoming um, increasingly common for uh, the younger generation. And a lot of it is tied to the uh, fact that they cannot make it uh, in terms of um, farming or uh, jobs and things like that in, in their hometown. Uh, so here's a quote from one of my participants that said, because they, the migrants, cannot earn enough money in the village, and because they get in debt, they leave the village to work. Uh, and so this is something that I noticed uh, across the three villages I focused on. And um, this slide here shows you that detail. Um, suffice to say, basically, that migration occurred in all of the three villages that I worked in. Uh, and the primary thing to take away from this uh, slide is that they were all um, migrating to two primary urban centers. So in my case, um, Phnom Penh and um, uh, cities in Thailand. Uh, and so then there was the second destination, of course, that was more common was the coastal town of Koh Kong, um, which was nearby. Uh, and the predominant reason for people migrating was employment as well as uh, laborers in construction or uh, in the factories. So um, here are some quotes just to capture kind of um, the differences between the people that stayed and the people that left. One uh, person here who uh, is uh, the group of uh, fishers in one of the villages said, it is not easy to relocate. We must have a lot of money. I have never dreamed to live outside because this community is my hometown and I have no other skill besides fishing. So for many people, it's also a very difficult thing to actually leave if they want to. Uh, in contrast, those who leave, this is a quote from uh, somebody who left the village. I chose to find work by myself because I wanted to help my family by earning income. In general, some workers, uh, garment workers are forced to work by their parents because the parents are unable to pay their debt. But some volunteer work, uh, volunteer to work after seeing their family issues. Um, so some key takeaways from um, what I, I've been covering is that coastal Cambodians are making tough decisions and trade-offs every day. And this you can extrapolate also to many other coastal areas uh, within Southeast Asia and possibly um, outside of that region as well. In the global south, there are different individual drivers to migration. A lot of it is, is related to indebtedness, but also a sense of responsibility. Uh, also important to highlight that a lot of young people want a better life and they see their parents struggling and they want higher wages. And so they're increasingly informed and mobile. 
And another driver of a migration is environmental change, of course. Uh, and one of the things um, that has emerged is the increasing development and lack of land tenure is also um, causing uncertainty about the future of coastal livelihoods and communities. Um, and so when you connect that to the increasing urban development, uh, there are some uh, observations that I've noticed with respect to climate resilience policy in Cambodia. And I'll quickly go over these. Uh, there's a limited understanding of the potential impacts of climate change. So here's our two quotes from the director of the Department of Climate Change from the Ministry of Environment, who says, we just know that wind is more serious now since it is frequent. There's no data showing saltwater intrusion, but there might be some areas affected and we need to study more. Uh, there's also a lack of integration of climate change projections into uh, adaptation plans and urban planning documents in many cases. So they're simply not just, there isn't, sometimes there's no data, but then the other times there's just no incorporation. Um, and then there's also a lack of systematic action to mitigate climate change related impacts. So you might see um, uh, actions to mitigate climate change on, on an individual uh, or a small community level, but there has to be also systematic actions that are done, uh, for example, by building for fortifying dikes to salt, stop saltwater intrusion. Um, and then lastly, my slide here, just uh, I have different areas of inquiry that uh, I think would be interesting to follow up on by um, those of you in the audience. Um, one is just to understand what are coastal communities doing to build their own resilience to impacts from climate change especially important in countries where there's limited government capacity like Cambodia, and there are challenges with respect to just uh, general capacity. Also what civil society organizations are doing um, to support climate resilience. Uh, this is also particularly in Cambodia where there is facing a lot of um, suppression. Um, the other aspect has to do with transparency with urban planning. Uh, it's very unclear and there is lack of information, publicly accessible information. There's also issues and um, opportunities around collective action to to buy to a call for action by the to the government. Um, but then there's also a very important aspect uh, is that projections are um, predicting that there will be decreases in rise in fish production. So how is Cambodia dealing with this? Uh, and then also how will haphazard development in in coastal cities such as Yunuk will affect the vulnerability to climate change. And there's a really important political economy component here where you're looking at Chinese investments and what does that actually mean for the future of these cities, both the residents, uh, the identity and, and culture. So these are just some of the areas that I hope will be um, inspiring or provide food for thought and uh, I welcome questions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Asif. That was a really fascinating case study. And, and thank you also for providing those quotes from folks on the front lines. That's really meaningful, especially for journalists. Um, we are now going to move into the Q&A um, section of the webinar. So please put your questions that you have into the Q&A feature, uh, and I will read them out and direct them towards our panelists. Uh, we will start with a question from James for Dr. Hill. Uh, he says, thank you for your presentation. Um, this is the problem of groundwater pushing up toxic waste seems like a huge and largely unrecognized problem. Clearly the best solution would be to remove and remediate the soil, but we know how expensive that is. Are there other mitigation or remediation strategies that can be employed? What can communities threatened by this problem do? Well, if it's a low level kind of contamination, you can actually use plants to pull some of the contaminants out of the soil, which is called phytoremediation but it takes a long time. And if you don't have that time, uh, because it's an area that's already experiencing flooding problems, it's too late for phytoremediation and you really should excavate that contamination. Um, phytoremediation could take 10 or 20 years, maybe longer. And it's only for low level contaminants. Um, if it's high concentration contaminants or very, very dangerous ones, it really needs to be either sequestered, put into some kind of safe container on dry land or remediated by chemically treating the soils um, by pumping and running it over carbon and other kinds of filters. So it, it is the expensive route for most of the sites we're talking about, or will pollute the nearshore environment and kill all those fish that Cambodian fishermen are looking for. 
Thank you. And just a follow up on that question for some of the examples of the artificial ponds that you mentioned. Uh, is that an issue for those areas as well? Or is there remediation that's done before those artificial ponds go in um, for people who are living in those ponds? Could pollution in the water become an issue? Right. That's the thing about the artificial ponds. They can be um left behind when soil is excavated that is too polluted to stay in the nearshore environment. So they would be an after effect of remediating uh, some of those contaminated soils. Uh, they don't have to be, you can dig them in clean soil, but it makes sense to live like an earthworm, dig up some of those old soils, process them, get them somewhere safe and uh, go ahead and then live in the hole with floating platforms not on the open ocean, I should emphasize. Um, floating on the open ocean is a whole other problem and I think much more difficult, but floating in artificial ponds is a, a good and doable thing. And some of those ponds could be aquaculture, some of those ponds could be habitat, some of them could be recreation. Thank you. We have an anonymous question here uh, for Dr. Asif that says, in cases like the one you described, when it is not the best short-term, not in the best short-term interest for governments to consider resilience or protective zoning with all the prospective capital flowing in, what recourse do affected communities have? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and I think that um, this is something that uh, um, is an emerging issue across coastal communities. So for example, the one I worked in in Southwest Cambodia, one of the issues with respect to uh, environmental change was sand mining. And so that's been covered uh, pretty effectively by journalists. Uh, but in terms of um, recourse for coast affected coastal communities, I think that um, we've seen the progress, the social progress we've seen in Cambodia, a lot of it has been because of collective action. So I, I'll give an ex the one example would be the rise in minimum wage for factory workers, garment workers. Um, and that has happened due to um, protests and, and, and active collective action. And so I think that um, similarly, these communities can band together. And I think that there's also a mindset shift that needs to happen. Um, if you understand Cambodia, you have to understand it from a historical context from the last 20, 30 years, where it emerged from a very post-conflict state, and it was dependent on donors. And so when I've talked to Cambodians and I asked them about what they can do, often the response is, well, we need help from donors or we need help from government. Um, and so there's also this aspect of collective action and the spirit of collective action that needs to be also cultivated. And there are great activists and other civil society type organizations that are doing this that show um, or that are showing Cambodians and communities that they have the individual and collective power to enact change. So I think more of that needs to happen. And um, you know, also putting to task the local um, decision makers as well, because oftentimes it's framed as the national government, but many of these uh, decisions are made at the provincial or district level. So the um, collective action at that level where you have, um, so in my specific case, for example, sand mining was happening in these coastal communities. So an organization helped train and gather these individuals in these village fishing villages and they all went to the town hall or the city hall the sort of the provincial hall and they stood outside and and demanded to speak to somebody in an authoritative position um and so that kind of you know answering or speaking to power um has led to you know certain changes of course i would also say that um eventually push comes to shove that uh, the powers that be in Cambodia will realize that it's also in their best long-term interest to actually incorporate resilience so that um, they're not having everyone living in floating villages. Thank you so much. And thank you for uh, highlighting the importance of, of activists and, and, and movements. Um, sort of a follow-up question uh, for both um, panelists, but perhaps we'll pass this over um, and focus on California for Dr. Hill, uh, since Dr. Seif just touched on this. But um, a question from Eric is, how would they describe overall government positions, actions, or strategies on these issues, both California and Cambodia? 
I think, sorry, in, I think in California, uh, the government certainly knows that it's coming and hasn't yet put a lot of money into it, but is hoping that by emphasizing how high sea levels can rise, they will um, help develop a private sector self-protective uh, set of strategies. And, and that's not happening. I mean, we're seeing private real estate developers and capital from China in particular, um, paying for new residential development right on the water's edge. So we're still developing places that are going to flood um, and be toxic because of uh, latent soil pollution. So we're not seeing the private sector respond to those signals yet. And I hope that means that the state will take a more direct role. But in our system, land use is a local decision. The state can't compel property owners to um, use, certain, use their land in certain ways. Um, those rights are held by the property owner. So there's a very important component of adaptation in the law that we need to be able to prevent vulnerable people from living in places that are um, gonna flood. Thank you. Um, we have another question here um, from Brittany um, for either of the panelists, if anyone has an answer, she's curious um, to know what infrastructure is being developed in the Caribbean. If either of you know of any examples. I I I can't uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Although I would imagine that they do have you know very similar issues as coastal Cambodia does, and in many parts of Southeast Asia, I imagine. I think maybe the difference there is that um, the government might be a bit more uh, nimble and uh, responsive, perhaps. And again, the Caribbean is a large area, so it really depends on which country you're talking about, because you have one of the poorest uh, countries, also some of the wealthiest as well. So, um, yeah, I, I can't think of anything specific because that's not my regional area, but uh, if Dr. Hill has anything to say. Yeah, I think there's a reason why those islands haven't really developed much of a strategy. Um, I mean, you could think of New Orleans as in the Caribbean, um, not quite, Gulf of Mexico, but connected. Uh, and they have certainly had to do a lot, but the islands have not done a lot. And that's in part because they're dealing with big events. And this is one of the big problems. If you're dealing with hurricanes and earthquakes, you don't have the bandwidth to deal with the slow incremental change represented by sea level rise. So that's a big problem for everyone who has those um, disaster events already, like California fire, super distracting for us and Hurricane Maria, super distracting for Puerto Rico and other countries, other islands in the, Pacific, in the Caribbean. Thank you. Um, we have another question for Dr. Asif, um, which is what can cities do to prepare for all the climate migration that is happening? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, perhaps a bit of a million dollar question. Um, and I would say that it, it depends on the cities uh, that we're talking about, but I know that in the case of um, uh, cities like Dhaka, for example, in Bangladesh and uh, Phnom Penh in my case, uh, we're seeing a lot more migration um, to the capital and to areas that already are at the capacity or limits of their capacity. Um, and I would say that um, one aspect has to do with um, providing opportunities for people in terms of livelihoods as well. Um, because one thing that can have knock-on effects is if you have a higher concentration of people in an urban environment, but then they're living on marginal land with uh, limited opportunities, and that's just gonna cause a domino effect in, in terms of problems. Uh, and then you have, yeah, different um, crises and that the city has to deal with. But I would say that, um, yeah, I would say it requires, um, you know, this sounds maybe sounds cliche, but it requires decision makers with imagination and uh, with the courage uh, to do these type of things for the people in these areas. And I think part of that has to do with um, the training and education for the younger generation that will also take this, the 
um, space or the step or their place of these other people that will, you know, eventually not be around. Um, so I think that's also an important thing. And that's happening in Cambodia, which is a nice promising thing to see. There are different organizations that are actually training um, the youth in uh, how to mobilize, how to understand these issues and how to actually um, use the channels that are used by, for example, lobbyists and the tactics that are used, but to voice the concerns for um, um, the urbanites that live in the area. So that's sort of a general kind of answer. But I think, yeah, again, it also highly depends on the, the context within which we're, we're discussing. And at least in Cambodia, um, there is a bit of um, um, a lack of, or a shrinking space, I should say, within uh, civil society and within that sort of public discourse. But uh, that space has to be maintained in order for any kind of uh, progress to be made. Thank you so much. Uh, we are nearing the end of the hour. Um, I, so I'd like to wrap up. I just wanted to ask both of the speakers to maybe give a final reflection or comment on the topic. Um, we do have a few more questions, but unfortunately not enough time to get to them. And I personally have many questions that I could ask as well, um, but we're near the, we're near the end. Um, also just a reminder, we'll be pasting uh, a link to a feedback survey in the chat. So um, for all the attendees, if you have a moment to fill that out, um, if you have any suggestions for the future, that would be helpful. And I will pass it to Dr. Hill for any last comments um, or feedback. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, in a closing comment that even relates to the migration comment, that's what question, uh, that's why adaptation in place is so critical because if hundreds of millions of people have to leave their homes to go live in, a, in larger cities, that's an internal economic disaster and a cross-border um, political and territorial challenge. So I think it's very, very important for us to focus on adaptation in place. And where that's possible is by moving dirt around, basically, not by building concrete and steel structures that are expensive to maintain and eventually become a liability. So if we can move dirt around and granting organizations or donor countries would help to pay for that, that you could use local labor. So it's a transferable strategy or technology to countries with a lot of labor and not a lot of capital. And it doesn't require complex maintenance. So I think that's a, a better strategy to look for. And it's a great story to think about um, what is the boondoggle component of building with concrete and steel? Is that really a good idea? So I hope that's been highlighted today and that people will think about those complicated uh, international consultant kinds of projects and really look at them with um, a skeptical eye. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Asif. Any final comments or reflections? I think Dr. Hill uh, captured a lot of the things and I think actually uh, reflecting on both of our presentations, I found that they have offered a nice compliment because one aspect related to, you know, the big picture thinking of how we need to rethink how we design these spaces. And uh, I was focusing on the people in, in these spaces, right? And you have this complex mix of uh, fisheries, farming, livelihoods, industry, ports, uh, commerce, you have a lot of these things, these things happening in the coastal space. And I think that, um, especially when I, you know, have traveled in Southeast Asia in particular, it seems so tired and boring that we follow that these countries are following the same template that we've already we already know does not work. So in the case of Bangkok, for example, in 2012, I think it was we had massive flooding. In, and to the point where the expressway, the, you know, the above road expressways that are on these giant concrete pillars, they were flooded. And so, and then that revealed the inequalities of urban resilience as well, because the areas that were walled, which were the ones that were the urban elites sort of hung out and lived, they were protected. But then because the water uh, increased, it pushed it towards the areas that were less uh, well off and, and where the urban poor lived. Um, and so you're seeing the consequences of this uh, uneven urban resilience planning happening live. And I think it's very frustrating to see these kinds of things being emulated in terms of this development and planning in Cambodia, in Sihanoukville in this case, but potentially other areas, then also in Phnom Penh where I lived. 
Um, so I think, yeah, we need to really, um, A, um, put to task the politicians and decision makers, and also if they're not willing to do it, uh, find others who are, um, frankly, and training the next generation to uh, um, have the knowledge and resources and skills to address these challenges uh, and, and think with um, more imagination. So I think that's uh, something that we need to do going forward in the next, uh, you know, several decades. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, thank you both for such clear and accessible and, and visual presentations. Um, and thank you to all of the attendees. Um, and, and also thank you again for highlighting sort of the, uh, what Dr. Hill called intergenerational equity, which I think is, is so, so critical and uh, considering how we need to adapt this infrastructure, not only for the environment, but for the communities and, and the people, not only there, that are there now, but uh, that will be moving and that will be there in 50, 100 years. Um, so that's really critical when talking about these issues. Um, that is our time for today. Uh, thank you everyone for joining this webinar. Uh, as a reminder, there is um, a survey in the chat now. So if attendees um, have a moment to fill that out, provide some feedback so we can continue to improve these events, that would be incredibly helpful. Um, also a reminder that once it's ready, you will receive uh, a link to this webinar and the recording, and I believe um, the presentations for your reference as well, um, as well as some contact information to get in touch um, and how to get in touch with the speakers. Um, so thank you very much to everyone for participating. Uh, yes, and a reminder also um, in the chat is about the uh, current uh, Coastal Resilience Media Grant opportunity. Reminder, those applications are due May 2nd. Thank you so much.